Good evening. My name is Tim Neff, and I'm a Vice President and Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I want to welcome you all to our monthly program entitled Spotlight On. We're so glad that you're here joining us this evening. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're returning, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all every second Thursday of the month for this special Spotlight On program. Tonight, we'll be focusing on the Grand Army of the Republic. And I think it's a uh, great opportunity just to say this program will be a nice uh, kind of companion piece to the program we did last month about the history of soldiers and sailors. Because really, the history of soldiers and sailors and the Grand Army of the Republic are tied together so closely. And we'll be talking a little bit about that this evening. But like I said, if you're new to the program, let me just tell you a little bit about soldiers and sailors. All right, let me pull up our slideshow here. Soldiers and Sailors uh, is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right on the uh, campus of the University of Pittsburgh in the Oakland neighborhood. It was built back in 1910 as a Civil War memorial. About 25,000 men from Allegheny County fought in the Civil War. And at the cost of about $1.25 million, they built this beautiful memorial to honor their service in the Union Army. Uh, however, since then, Soldiers and Sailors has gone through many evolutions and changes to where we are today, standing as a nonprofit trust that uh, honors veterans not only from the Civil War, but all the way up through present day. And our museum is filled with artifacts that have been donated to us through the years by veterans and their families. And we use these items to tell their story and to honor their service to our country. So if you haven't been to Soldiers and Sailors before, please come and visit us sometime. I'll talk a little bit more about how you can do that at the end. Um, and if you've been there before, we'd love to see you again. And you can always learn more at Soldiers and Sailors Hall Dot org. If you want to learn about how to visit the museum, upcoming programs, all of that good stuff, it's all available on our website. For tonight's program about the Grand Army of the Republic, if you want to uh, submit a question, it's real easy to do if you're on Facebook. All you have to do is post a comment and we'll see it there. If you're watching on YouTube, it is a little bit different. You have to email us at soldiersandsailorspittsburgh at gmail.com. And if we don't get to your answer this, uh, your question this evening on YouTube, we will certainly get you an answer via that email. Uh, so please feel free, we'll take questions at the end of the program. And I'll be joined tonight by Rich Condon, who is a public historian and founder of Civil War Pittsburgh, and uh, has been a longtime friend to soldiers and sailors. He has volunteered at our organization. Uh, he is uh, uh, now working in the National Park Service and a great, great, great friend. And uh, we're very excited to learn from Rich all about uh, the Grand Army of the Republic this evening. So, Rich, how are you doing this evening? And welcome to our program. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're so glad to have you with us. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to tonight's program. And uh, really, without further ado, I'll pull our slideshow back up. And I think we're going to jump right in to this um, organization that, uh, like I said, is so closely tied to this, uh, to soldiers and sailors and our history and really to our formation and how we got started. And uh, Rich, I'll let you go ahead and take it away here. And uh, you know, as we move through here, just let me know when you need me to switch the slides and uh, you can go ahead and take it from here. Sure, thanks, Tim. Um, so <clears throat> as Tim mentioned, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic um, is deeply embedded in our, our Civil War history uh, in Western Pennsylvania and really across uh, the entire country. Um, you know, specifically, and we'll talk about this later on, uh, the history of Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum is, uh, is deeply tied in with the uh, Grand Army of the Republic. And this is kind of one of, the, I think, the long uh, lasting tangibles uh, from the days of uh, the GAR. Um, We'll talk about what fraternity, charity, and loyalty means here in just a minute, but that is kind of the the uh, the founding core of the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, you know, this was an organization that was born uh, in the wake of the Civil War, you know, not even a, a year after the war is over, um, or the last shots are fired at uh, Appomattox. Um, and this is an organization that will continue uh, well into the 19... 50s with the death of the last uh, GAR veteran or Union veteran um, in 1956, Albert Wilson, and we'll, we'll talk about him later on as, as well. Um, Tim, if you don't mind, could you switch to the next slide? Thank you. All right. So um, as I mentioned, the Grand Army of the Republic um, is this organization that was formed 
um, for veterans, for U.S. military veterans. So it could be Army, Navy, Marines, you name it. Um, and of course, there's there's some other intricacies in there as well. Um, but uh, this organization is formed in 1866 by Dr. Benjamin uh, F. Stevenson of Decatur, Illinois, not not too far away from uh, Springfield. Uh, Stevenson is a veteran of the 14th Illinois uh, Volunteer Infantry. And the idea for this organization, this fraternal organization, uh, was actually born while the war was going on. Um, according to Stevenson, he had um, had a conversation with one of his messmates. Um, they were talking about, you know, what happens when this war is over? You know, it's a conversation that I think a lot of um, soldiers had during the war. What do we do when all this is over? When, what do we do when we go home? And this is kind of where the seed was planted uh, for the GAR. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, when they go back to, you know, a normal civilian life, might not be able to relate to what these men had seen on the battlefield or experienced in the camps. So that's kind of where this is this is all originating. Uh, of course, like I said, the GAR comes to fruition uh, April 6, 1866, uh, born in Illinois. Uh, shortly after that first chapter is started, it, it catches pretty quickly. Uh, eventually, we'll, we'll spread from Illinois outward uh, to the rest of um, the states of the Union um, from that point onward, and even eventually uh, states in the former Confederacy. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, them as well. As I mentioned, the three core principles of this organization, uh, the Grand Army Republic, is fraternity, charity, and loyalty. Um, we'll talk about what that means in our, our next slide here, if uh, you wouldn't mind forwarding, Tim. So the idea here is to have a support system, really. Uh, fraternity is to preserve and strengthen those kind and fraternal feelings which bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who united to suppress the late rebellion and perpetuate the memory and history of the dead. So really what we're seeing here is, is uh, a brotherhood that's formed in the Grand Army. Uh, charity is to assist uh, former comrades in arms as needed help and protection and to extend needful aid to the widows and orphans of those who had fallen. So not only are thinking about the veterans, but uh, everyone that is involved, uh, you know, as far as, as families go, you know, when there's that empty chair at the dinner table, who's going to be taking care of these families? Uh, you know, that really uh, involves financial support as well. Um, and finally, loyalty to maintain true allegiance to the United States based upon a paramount respect for and fidelity to its constitutions and laws and encourage the spread of universal liberty, equal rights and justice to all men. So what's really interesting about the Grand Army of the Republic is. This is an organization that um, is open to all U.S. military veterans. Um, you know, outwardly, it projects itself as kind of this great equalizer as, as well. You know, it doesn't matter if uh, if you were a captain, a colonel, a private, a corporal, what have you. In a JR, um, you know, you could have a private that or a former private in the U.S. Army who is now a post commander and having a former captain serving under him. Um, it doesn't matter. Your, uh, your your social status in civilian life, you know, the GAR is kind of providing this this equal foundation for um, all these veterans. And so, um, you know, with, with that being said, this is also a, I don't think it was meant to be this necessarily right off the bat, but um, a, a political powerhouse. You know, the Grand Army of the Republic is largely made up of uh, men who uh, supported the, um, we'll, we'll call it the Republican Party of Lincoln. And, uh, you know, during Reconstruction, these guys are, many of them, supporting uh, equal rights, especially for 
uh, their brethren, African-American veterans um, who, um, you know, until 1868, weren't even considered citizens of the United States yet until the passing of the 14th Amendment. Uh, so they use this leverage, this organization to to kind of push this for a bit until uh, 1868 uh, at the Philadelphia encampment. Um, it's actually declared uh, the purpose of the, the Grand Army of the Republic was to secure the rights of the defenders of their country by all moral, social, and political means in our control. Yet this association does not design to make nominations for the office or to use its influence as a secret secret organization for partisan purposes. So it, it's trying to avoid being this, this big political powerhouse, which eventually kind of leads to a decline in membership by um, the mid 1870s. Um, if you could uh, go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, with this power, of course, comes uh, a long lasting legacy uh, as well. Um, probably the most well known uh, is Memorial Day or what originated as Decoration Day. And this will actually begin in uh, 1868, the uh, head of the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, John A. Logan, a former commander of the 15th U.S. Army Corps, um, is going to instate uh, Memorial Day as a uh, national holiday or propose it as a national holiday. Uh, through orders number 11, uh, Logan is going to uh, state the 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of uh, screwing with flowers and otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet, churchyard, and the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their, will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. So, um, you know, with the end of the Civil War, people had um, mourned and honored the dead in their own way. But as time goes on, um, it becomes a bit more uh, formalized and organized. And especially with the uh, JR, with the amount of power that they have and kind of their purpose, uh, as we had mentioned, a, lar a, you know, bar a large part of their purpose is honoring the dead, remembering uh, the fallen from uh, the period between 1861 and 65, this needs to be something that is done in perpetuity. And so in 1868, uh, they begin to formalize uh, Memorial Day uh, at the end of end of May uh, every year. It's something, of course, we continue to do the, to this day in some way, shape, or form. You know, a lot of it uh, takes the form of parades. And of course, uh, if you go to most Memorial Day parades today, where do they end up? The cemetery. And what do we do in the cemetery? Usually lay flowers, have some kind of ceremony uh, honoring the dead. And this all begins in the wake of the Civil War when we're trying to reckon with this large loss of life. Um, you know, the estimated number is 720,000 dead uh, that we know of. Um, you know, these men, these veterans are trying to come to terms with that. Um, and that's all part of Memorial Day. Now, of course, this is celebrated in uh, many northern communities or all northern communities where uh, U.S. military veterans uh, reside. But it becomes a bit spotty throughout the American South. As I mentioned, there are um, some GAR posts in the American South, especially um, places where you had... Um, maybe U.S. Army veterans who moved south during Reconstruction, or, you know, you might have had, uh, and I'll use South Carolina as an example, African-American veterans who uh, were formerly enslaved uh, who joined the Union Army during the war and stayed to what they know. You know, uh, and like I said, mentioned South Carolina, on the uh, the coast down near Beaufort, South Carolina, David Hunter Post, uh, number nine, was African-American veterans from the Sea Islands, uh, particularly the uh, 33rd, 34th United States Colored Troops. 
Memorial Day ceremonies are deeply rooted in those communities. Um, but as time grow, goes on, um, they start to fade a bit. And we'll talk about that, uh, I believe, in our next slide, if you don't mind forwarding, Tim. Yeah, before I jump into that, Rich, I just yeah. want to point out every year, Soldiers and Sailors, uh, that's one of our biggest events of the year on Memorial Day, where we're open free to the public. And uh, it's a big part of what we're all about. And we've actually done a couple programs on Spotlight on, on Memorial Day. So I encourage you, if you want to learn more about this and uh, other connections that we have to Memorial Day, we have uh, several programs in our archives. So I just wanted to mention that uh, as we move on here to the uh, to the next slide. And, and yeah, so thank you for sharing that, Tim. Uh, there's, you know, in addition to soldiers and sailors, of course, there are a multitude of uh, Memorial Day parades in Western Pennsylvania. Um, one that comes to mind in particular is the one in Lawrenceville, um, which I believe may be the longest running uh, Memorial Day parade in at least Pennsylvania. Of course, concludes at uh, Allegheny Cemetery, where there are many uh, Grand Army veterans buried. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as, as time rolls on um, following the Civil War, memorialization uh, and Memorial Day take on uh, different shapes in different places. Uh, memorialization, I guess the, the, the tangible memorialization that we see today uh, comes in the form of monumentation. You, know, you go to many places um, throughout Pennsylvania, whether it be a small town or somewhere in Pittsburgh. I mean, Soldiers and Sailors um, is a great example. These are, are tangible reminders of the military service of, of U.S. Army or Navy or Marine veterans um, that, that we can still see today. A lot of these monuments were erected, you know, from the 1870s, 80s onward. Um, in Pittsburgh in particular, you know, we have, as I mentioned, soldiers and sailors. There's the uh, Allegheny County Soldiers Monument in um, uh, Allegheny Commons Park. I guess uh, that'd be right next to Lake Elizabeth in the north side. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one was act actually erected in uh, 1871. Just across the way uh, in Allegheny Commons, there is the Hampton Battery Monument. You see this stuff everywhere. And of course, uh, something that I think has become a hot topic over the last couple of years, especially, is this monumentation in uh, southern states or the former Confederacy. And um, in particular, this one that I have pictured here uh, it was in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I believe this was actually taken down in July of 2020. This is the Confederate uh, Soldiers and Sailors Monument in, in the city of Richmond. And, uh, you know, these monuments are being erected around the same time, you know, uh, GAR veterans are erecting uh, monuments to their dead as well. Um, and so there's a bit of uh, contention there. Um, you know, some of these, I, th I think our, our vision of the Grand Army of the Republic, these U.S. military veterans and Confederate veterans is um, generally this idea that they had reconciled by this point in time, they had buried the hatchet. And everything's fine. Well, if we read some of these contemporary accounts, uh, even from the 1890s, that's not necessarily the case. Um, there's actually one uh, really great account I want to share with you, uh, if you don't mind, um, from uh, around Memorial Day or shortly after Memorial Day uh, in August of 1894. This is an account that was shared by the Assistant Inspector General for the states of Virginia and North Carolina. And um, this is around the time, you know, this memorial was erected in uh, 1894, in May of 1894. And this Grand Army veteran is looking at how Memorial Day is being observed or not observed in the American South. Uh, this is, you know, 30 years after the war is over. This is his observance. The high water mark of the Grand Army of the Republic in this department has no doubt been reached. A few years more in our long and unequal struggle will have ended. For no section of the Union has the existence of the Grand Army of the Republic been threatened to the extent it has here. Upon the one side, we are contending against overwhelming numbers and resources. On the other, we are expected to keep abreast of our more favored comrades of the North in caring for him who has borne the battle for his widow and orphan, and suitably remembering each year 
the 100,000 graves are of our heroic dead. A few years ago, our comrades of the North, East, and West contributed nearly 20 grand toward the erection of a home in this city, in Richmond, for indignant Confederates. And, wh and whilst this generosity on the part of those comrades was most commendable, it is not strange that with more than 100,000 comrades buried in this department to be remembered, and with an urgent need of substantial support in some well-considered plan for the building up of a wider loyal sentiment here, that beyond contributing toward Memorial, Memorial Day expenses, our loyal friends in the North have been the more generous to the other side, I think. The sentiments expressed by Reverend Cave here in Richmond at the recent unveiling of a monument to the Confederate soldiers and sailors of this city and their hearty endorsement by Confederate camps and the Southern people generally has given rise to much earnest discussion between the two sections of our common country. Since Mr. Cave and the well nigh whole South have avowed sentiments which, if allowed to prevail, would again threaten the life of the Republic, it is well perhaps that this incident occurred as it confirms our contention that there are none so loyal to our country's flag as though who, those who fought to uphold it, and that true allegiance to the national government cannot be maintained by any citizen who would hold to the views that the surrender of Appomattox settled nothing. The Union soldier cannot become reconciled to any proposition which does not condemn such teachings. They further hold that he who prefers the company of the Confederate flag to that of old glory makes assurance doubly sure that there is such a thing as dividing one's allegiance between two flags on the line of loving one and respecting the other. In this connection, I must give you the reply of one of my comrades here when asked what he thought of the immense display of Confederate flags on the occasion of the unveiling uh, of the above referred to monument. He observed that upon the question of allowing two flags to represent the American people, the North was not unlike the South, for they revered one and tolerated another. The South did the same, but they're not the same flags. And so, you know, some of these uh, observations, or as I mentioned, non-observations of Memorial Day in the South, are creating these this divide um, between the, the Grand Army and some of these Confederate veterans in the South. Um, you know, as he mentioned, there was money contributed uh, in a reconciliatory, reconciliatory manner, uh, contributed to erect a Confederate soldier's home for these aging veterans in Richmond. Um, however, the, the Grand Army does not take an official stance on uh, donating money uh, to Confederate veterans. Uh, in fact, in the, uh, the GAR Blue Book of 1904, they specifically state that we as an organization do not donate money to uh, Confederate veterans or Confederate homes, but uh, veterans can do it independently and on their own. But this just is kind of one of those interesting, um, you know, like I said, one of these kind of wedges that we see uh, driven in American society that we don't really think about, um, you know, when we think about the Grand Army of the Republic and Confederate veterans. You know, we, we imagine by the 1890s that uh, the, the hatchet's been buried, that we're now living in harmony, which could probably not be further from the truth, <laughs> um, especially when you read some of these the, these accounts. Uh, if you don't mind, Tim, could you? Uh, there we go. And, you know, the veterans that, that I think of, too, uh, when I think of these these divides are, are, are African-American veterans as well. Um, and, you know, in Pittsburgh specifically, we have quite a few. Um, there's this pretty well-known image on the right-hand side. Um, unfortunately, we don't know his name, um, but he's an unknown African-American veteran uh, from the John Patterson GAR post, which was um, – in Pittsburgh South Side on East Carson Street. Um, on the left-hand side, we see a well-known picture, uh, especially uh, for those in Western PA, of uh, the uh, Thomas SBGAR post in Carnegie. Pardon me. And if you're able to look closely, uh, you can actually pick out a handful of African-American veterans uh, sprinkled uh, amongst the post. Um, one thing to note is like I mentioned, there, there's no formal segregation uh, of the GAR. However, you will see 
independent African-American posts. In, in Pennsylvania alone, uh, there are 15 all-black posts. One of them, uh, one of the really well-known ones, is in Pittsburgh, which is the Robert Gould Shaw post 206. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there is no uh, outward segregation in the GAR. In fact, in 1872, the Pennsylvania Department commander, a guy named Henry Reeder, uh, formally stated, we care nothing for a man's um, uh, nationality, race, politics, or religion. The fact that a man was ready at the call of his country in her hour of danger, when stout hearts quailed and brave men faltered, is all the GAR seeks to know. So the, the color of your skin does not matter outwardly to the GAR. Does that mean that everyone's completely on board with the idea of uh, racial equality? Not necessarily. Um, you know, it, it, this is still the, uh, the Jim Crow era. Um, but that does not mean that they're not uh, raising funds and supporting these ideas as an organization, uh, say, for, um, you know, acquiring uh, pensions for African-American veterans or supporting this idea of uh, African-American men uh, being able to vote, which eventually will come uh, with the 15th Amendment in 1870. Um, these uh, African-American veterans, um, of course, uh, like I said, use their membership in the JR um, as a point of pride as well. Um, this is, you know, kind of a, a, a tangible and intangible um, reflection of their service in the United States Army. You know, in the 19th century and earlier, uh, military service uh, for one's country is seen as a pathway uh, towards citizenship. These guys had, had fought for their rights to be called citizens in the United States. And of course, like I said earlier, that is, is solidified, um, codified in law with the 14th Amendment. Um, it's something they had worked for uh, for a long time, and it's something they're very proud of. Um, but they also use this as kind of a, a way to organize and push for social change. Um, in, in one particular instance that I like to mention, um, Robert Gould Shaw posts 206 um, in September of 1894 are going to meet in the city of Pittsburgh during the 28th annual na uh, national encampment, which I'll talk about here shortly, um, they're going to they're going to meet uh, during the encampment uh, with the backdrop of thousands of other Grand Army veterans from across the country, and they're arguing uh, for uh, uh, an anti-lynch law. In fact, they're supporting um, the work of a young woman named Ida B. Wells uh, from uh, Northern Mississippi who had witnessed the horrors of uh, racial terrorism in the American South during Reconstruction, in many cases carried her, uh, out against uh, Black men who had served in the U.S. Army uh, during the Civil War. Um, after witnessing all these horrors, she advocates for uh, anti-lynching laws. On September 17, 1894, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uh, published a short blip about these men meeting in Pittsburgh. And they say, at the campfire of the colored veterans last Thursday, resolutions were adopted denouncing the practice of lynch law in the South. The resolution stated that these outrages are daily growing in frequency. They endorsed the work of Miss Ida B. Wells, a young colored woman who has been working in the interests of the anti-lynching league. The campfire recommends the colored people in the several states states start a fund and assist each other in securing their rights at all public places of amusement, hotels, etc. Uh, and they continue, uh, if these outrages cannot be stopped by other means and all other methods do not avail, we should not hesitate to offer our lives to the cause of our redemption and salvation. So uh, as I mentioned, the GAR becomes, even though, you know, by that point in time, it's not necessarily a um, political organization, uh, there are uh, advantages to, to the membership, especially for um, African-American veterans. Like I said before, uh, you know, as this organization kind of 
uh, decides they're not going to be supporting uh, one political party necessarily, um, you know, the membership will drop off by the early uh, mid 1870s. However, it will start to pick up again in the early to mid 1880s, which, you know, at that point, you're seeing a lot of these guys are starting to, to age. Um, the membership starts to uh, to bump up because they're trying to get pensions. Um, you know, whether you're, you're black or white, a lot of these guys need pensions as they're starting to age or or form ailments or especially guys that had uh, been wounded or or received uh, or had some kind of illness uh, during their wartime uh, service. Uh, Tim, if you wouldn't mind skipping to the next one. And so, uh, as I mentioned, um, this uh, 28th annual encampment. So um, if you're not familiar with uh, a national encampment is. It was basically um, from the onset of uh, the creation of the Grand Army of the Republic or soon after. Uh, every year, there would be a national gathering uh, of these veterans. So basically, these men would come from across the country, uh, meet in usually some kind of major city. And for several days, this is where they're holding their national meetings. And from there, it kind of breaks down to these smaller meetings, as we kind of see uh, with these black veterans from the Robert Gould Shaw Post in uh, 1894. Uh, in 1893, uh, when they were holding their national encampment in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, it was decided that the next gathering would uh, take place in Pittsburgh. And so the dates are set aside uh, September 10th to the 14th, 1894, uh, for these veterans to gather in the city of Pittsburgh and really, it, it becomes uh, a pretty major deal. It's, it's one of the largest gatherings in our city's history, at least in the 19th century. Um, you know, they're going to uh, ultimately have um, almost 1,200 veteran or delegates registered. Um, they're expecting around 19 to 20,000 veterans to attend. Keep in mind, you know, at this point in 1894. A lot of these guys, it can be difficult for them to to make it to uh, an event like this. Uh, if they're coming from, say, Colorado, uh, or uh, even from Maine or Massachusetts, that that's quite a hike. You know, we don't have the modern conveniences of of taking a flight into Pittsburgh. You know, they're booking uh, a train uh, more often than not, and uh, there are. Uh, efforts put put into place to try and uh, and and pay for their transportation, to provide them some kind of housing, um, and so we know that there's quite a few uh, people in the city of Pittsburgh who open their homes to these veterans. There are hotels giving discounts. There are um, clothing stores that are dropping prices exponentially uh, for soldiers so they can get clothing while they're in town. Um, in fact, some of them will even fashion uh, GAR uniforms for this special occasion. Um, you can imagine economically, this is great for the city of Pittsburgh as well. Um, there are, uh, I know on at least Mount Washington and other heights around the city, they are going to erect uh, tall electric lights that are you know 30 feet in height saying GAR. This is a grand event. Um, and at this point in time, you know, as I mentioned, they're expecting 19, 20,000 veterans to show up. There are about 400,000 veterans enrolled across the country. So as I mentioned, a lot of these guys might be uh, immobilized and unable to um, unfortunately attend in person. Um, at this point too, there's, there's a lot of newspapers uh, covering the event. They're estimating there's about 200,000 people in attendance uh, watching this as it unfolds. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Tim, skip into the next. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of people are preparing for this event. Uh, that includes the preparation of uh, souvenirs, both for visitors and onlookers and veterans themselves. Um, this one I want to share. This, this is a cool piece uh, that I found a few years ago. This medal on the left-hand side, you can actually see there's a little um, keystone attached to the bar at top at the top of uh, the metal and uh, inside the keystone is the uh, Fort, Pitt, Fort Pitt blockhouse. Um, the metal itself is actually crafted from um, a 
uh, decommissioned uh, artillery piece, a uh, um, uh, uh, tube, which you can actually see uh, pictured on the right-hand side here. It's a uh, almost uh, almost 2,000 pound gun, uh, which was reportedly removed from Allegheny Arsenal in uh, the Lawrenceville neighborhood of Pittsburgh, melted down, and uh, that metal was used to fashion um, these pieces, which were uh, sold to veterans that are attending the event um, in Pittsburgh. Uh, if you wouldn't go to, uh, mind going to the next one. Uh, also, uh, the, the city itself will take on a different appearance as well. Um, you know, for example, here we see a picture uh, taken in Highland Park where um, there's been you know, quite a bit of landscaping done for this special event. The flower beds, as you can see, uh, were fashioned into a large uh, Grand Army star. You can see in the middle there. Uh, but also a couple of different uh, core badges. Um, one in particular off the left-hand side is the second core. You can also see above that uh, the signal core. Um, and so, you know, like I said, this this is an event where people are going all out to support um, these Grand Army veterans. Of course, knowing that the the the, the years that they're going to be able to do this in the future are now numbered, as they're starting to see the ranks of the Grand Army starting to dwindle. Uh, next one, please. Thank you. Um, so aside from the what they call the campfire meetings, which were basically just their their post meetings or departmental meetings, um, one of the big events was the parade. And so now uh, this actually takes place on September 11th, 1894. And you can see the uh, the parade route starts in downtown Pittsburgh, um, right there along the Allegheny River. They step off and will march across across the Sixth Street Bridge, or what we now know as the uh, Roberto Clemente Bridge, um, to Allegheny City, what is now uh, Pittsburgh's north side. Uh, proceeds down to Allegheny Commons, actually uh, around where the uh, Allegheny County Soldiers Memorial is located today, and it ends on Cedar Avenue. If anyone's familiar uh, with the um, the Hamptons Battery Monument in the north side or the uh, the Elks Lodge, that's about where it concludes. Um, and if you uh, continue, Tim, there are uh, there are some photos of the parade and the uh, the procession through town. On the left hand side, that's through the city of Pittsburgh, as well as on the right hand side. Um, the actually in the, the right hand uh, photo, you can see there are, there are several spots along the parade route where they erected um, these large arches. And, um, you know, uh, uh, on those arches, you can see uh, there are on the top, it's kind of hard to make out, but there's um, three figures uh, representing uh, Navy, Army, uh, Marines. Um, and uh, fraternity, charity, and loyalty are, of course, spread across there in, in big letters as well. Um, and you can see, too, look if you look closely, you can see people are hanging out the windows, hanging off the buildings. There is, um, you know, patriotic bunting that is spread across all these buildings, these windows. And if you look closely toward the bottom there, you can see these GAR posts and neat lines uh, carrying their national colors. And uh, please go to the next one. Uh, on the left-hand side is um, the Sixth Street Bridge. Um, so that's how it would have looked uh, at the time in 1894 as they were crossing uh, into Allegheny City. Uh, and this is actually kind of uh, your oriented looking in the direction of the north side. And on the right, uh, you can see, again, these veterans marching down Federal Street. So uh, in the far distance is... Uh, is actually the bridge. So we're in the right-hand side picture. We're looking toward the city of Pittsburgh. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I was researching some of the businesses that are pictured there. Um, and by my estimation, this would have been taken roughly um, where PNC Park stands today. If you wouldn't mind, go to the next one. And of course, none of this would be possible either um, without support or a, a support system. Um, you know, as time grinds on, that support takes the form of uh, eventually the sons of Union veterans or daughter uh, daughters of Union veterans, but 
especially the women's relief corps. Um, you know, the women's relief corps uh, are, are kind of representative of this support system that these men have had for, well, since the time of the war, you know, back home on the home front, you know, who's taking care of the homestead? Um, who's supporting these guys uh, when they're off on the, the war front? It kind of continues into the latter 19th century and into the 20th century. Uh, many of these uh, women um, are, are going to dedicate themselves to taking care of these men as they get to a point where they can't do it for themselves. Um, in particular, uh, in 1894, we have Sarah Mink, who is the national president uh, of the Women's Relief Corps. And just to kind of give you a quick rundown of their purpose, um, you know, this organization founded in 1879, uh, these are kind of their core values, uh, very similar to the Grand Army of the Republic. First is especially aid and assist the Grand Army of the Republic and to perpetuate the memory of their heroic dead. Second is to assist such Union veterans as may need help and protection and to extend needful aid to their widows and orphans to find them homes and employment and ensure them of sympathy, sympathy and friends to cherish and emulate the deeds of the Army nurses and all of loyal women who rendered loving service to our country in her hour of peril. And third, to maintain true allegiance to the United States of America to inculcate lessons of patriotism and love of country among the children and in the community and encourage the spread of universal liberty and equal rights for all. And so this is their purpose, uh, continues well into the 20th century. In fact, aside from uh, supporting the veterans themselves, uh, many of these women are also educators. And as, as mentioned uh, in the uh, third statute of their founding, um, they're going to, into schools, uh, both north and south, um, with a varying level of success and trying to teach kind of this, um, the, the true story of the Civil War and, you know, discussing the sacrifice of U.S. military veterans. Um, so I think, you know, like I said, none of this would really be possible um, without this, uh, this support system uh, as well. And uh, if you wouldn't mind going to the next one. And so, you know, as I mentioned kind of earlier in the program, there are these certain tangible and in, intangible uh, remnants of the Grand Army of the Republic. And I think, uh, especially in Pittsburgh, uh, one of the, the, the most prevalent is Soldiers and Sailors Memorial uh, Hall. And I'll, I'll let Tim speak more about that here in a little bit. Um, but, you know, this this was something that was kind of in the works uh, from the late 19th century onward, discussing, uh, you know, building a place where uh, there could be a repository for, you know, artifacts, for Grand Army veterans to meet, um, where uh, really a multitude of posts did meet uh, after it was constructed or finished in, in 1910. You can see on the left hand side here, this photo. Uh, is from Library of Congress, uh, taken from uh, Fifth Avenue, looking up toward soldiers and sailors, really hasn't changed in appearance at all uh, since it was dedicated. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is from 1908, um, the, uh, the cornerstone laying. You can actually see some of these GAR veterans lined up uh, for that grand event as well. Um, and if you wouldn't mind going to the next one, Tim, thank you. Um, and this, this is kind of my, my final, uh, slide here talking about the, uh, the end of the grand army of the Republic, but also kind of tying in those tangibles. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the grand army of the Republic, uh, comes to fruition is born on April 6th, 1866. And, uh, sunset will be in, uh, 1956. Um, with the death of Albert Wilson. Um, Albert Wilson was a, a veteran from Duluth, uh, Minnesota. Um, he was very young when he enlisted. Uh, I believe he enlisted in October of 1864, um, was stationed in some of the defenses around Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, had never uh, seen any combat, but, um, you know, because of his service, because he had enlisted um, between uh, April of 1861 and April of 1865, 
he qualified for Grand Army membership. Um, and, uh, you know, he will be the very last one. He's the last uh, U.S. Army veteran from the Civil War that we know of um, and the last Grand Army veteran. In fact, uh, not too far from where I'm speaking to you, you from now in uh, Gettysburg, um, there is a monument to Albert Wilson on Cemetery Ridge. And uh, you can actually see that on the, the right-hand side. Uh, Wilson's uh, monument kind of overlooks the site of, uh, of Pickett's Charge. On the left-hand side, um, you can see in May of 1956, so just uh, actually a couple of days before um, Memorial Day, uh, they announced that they're going to dedicate this uh, monument to Wilson. And he actually passed away just a couple of months later in August. Um, what's interesting is this is also about the time um, as this this generation had you know died off that uh, Remembrance Day ceremonies or parades are being held here in Gettysburg. Um, and typically when these parades were were starting out, they were actually concluding or ending the parade at the Albert Wilson Monument. Um, I don't know if they still do today, but I think it's a bit symbolic um, of kind of the, the track of the Grand Army and um, and really, you know, where, uh, where this organization ends and it ends with him. Um, with that being said, you know, we can still uh, learn about the Grand Army at places like this, whether it be Gettysburg or Soldiers and Sailors, or uh, if you go to the Thomas Espy Post in Carnegie, uh, the Andrew Carnegie Free Library, um, these are all places you can uh, learn a bit more about the Grand Army of the Republic and kind of their long lasting legacy. So uh, I wanna thank you for uh, for tuning in. Uh, I'll turn it over to Tim here and let, let him wrap it up. Thank you so much, Rich. A lot of great information. Um, and uh, I appreciate your, your time this evening and uh, a lot of great comments that uh, I, I will try to recognize here as we as we start to move towards the end. But before we do that, I did want to uh, touch on a few things that are kind of related to the GAR, of course, but also specifically to your presentation, Rich, that also tie everything back to soldiers and sailors. And uh, one of the most obvious ones, you know, your photo there of the uh, laying of our cornerstone in 1908. And um, that was a wonderful photograph. Both myself and Michael Krauss, our curator, um, were, were fascinated by that that well-defined photo of the of the cornerstone. And uh, what uh, was also happening at that time, though, within the cornerstone, was this copper box was placed. It was a, a primitive time capsule, if you will. And uh, as a part of you know our hundredth year anniversary, it actually was about a hundred and two year anniversary. Um, we pulled that cornerstone. Um, and pulled the copper box out of it. And we had this very exciting uh, reveal planned. And I know our curator, Michael Krauss, was, was there and we had a little bit of media there and we pulled the copper box. And lo and behold, due to condensation through the years, everything within the box had kind of turned into this, this we call it our cake, what you're seeing there <laughs> on the right. Uh, a lot of paper materials, things that just melded together into this, this cake. And like I said, uh, we were doing this in 2010, so that was 100 and years, 102 years of condensation. This is this is what you get for for not sealing the copper box properly. Um, but luckily, um, because of a article in the Pittsburgh Sun Telegraph, we knew mostly what was in the box. Uh, a lot of you know portraits, uh, architect specifications, which I found pretty neat. You know, to the building was was included in there. Uh, meeting minutes, newspapers, maps. Um, some money, Confederate and, U, uh, and uh, U.S. money, um, GAR rosters, uh, GAR badges. And uh, we decided that, you know, we didn't want it to end there. You know, yes, it was a little disappointing, but we wanted to take it one step further. So we actually took this cake to the um, county medical examiner's office and we had it x-rayed. And uh, you can actually see within that layers of paper uh, several Civil War medals. Uh, and we have a, a diagram that you can see that in this exhibit at the hall. So uh, just a, 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 a it was a, 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 a disappointing in a way, but also, you know, that's part of the fun, you know, the, the Al Capone's vault, if you will, uh, uh, component to it. You know, it was it uh, we made the best of it. And now it's a, it's still a story and a beautiful exhibit we have at the at the museum. And, you know, at that time, we took the opportunity to place a new uh, time capsule within the cornerstone. That was uh, 
sealed correctly and in a stainless steel box. Uh, we had the help of CMU students to create a, a uh, lasting tribute to uh, soldiers and sailors in the Pittsburgh region. And we put mementos in there kind of touching on the, the history of the building and, and the city of Pittsburgh. So hopefully in a, another hundred or so years, people will open that and, and find some of the interesting things we placed in there. So um, the GAR in this case, you know, was certainly uh, um, following those traditions of, of placing a, a time capsule in the cornerstone. Um, also wanted to take a moment to mention, we actually mentioned this story in the last program, uh, they met, uh, last month that we did about the history of soldiers and sailors. But since you brought up women uh, specifically in the GAR, this is uh, Anna Sharp McDonald. And she is pictured there on the left. You can just make her out because she's wearing white within this sea of uh, GAR veterans at our grand opening of Soldiers and Sailors. She is the only woman sitting there. And uh, she was associated with Post 3 uh, from the North Side or Allegheny City, the Alexander Hayes Post. And uh, she got the right to sit there because she was basically granted an honorary membership because of all that she did for, for Post 3. Uh, she organized events. Uh, she sang at events. Uh, I understand she sang at the Cornerstone Lane here at Soldiers and Sailors. So she was actually a part of that program. And uh, I, 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 she's wearing a little badge there. And if, if you tune in for, to last month's program, Michael uh, shows you that badge. But um, there's also a little note to that, that the plaque with the portrait that she uh, has there refers to her as Comrade Bob. And we're assuming this is a moniker given to soften the appearance of a women's name on a post roster. So... Technically, as we were saying, this women were not allowed to be members of these posts, but clearly in rare occasions, there were rules that were skirted. And uh, in this case, Comrade Bob was uh, admitted as an honorary member. And you can see this uh, beautiful photo in, a, in the Gettysburg Room at Soldiers and Sailors. This is a really cool. This is our vault uh, at the museum. Not everybody gets to see this. This is really only available for the behind the scenes tour. Um, and you're seeing the entranceway to the vault and then this great um, metal case that lists the uh, 28 posts from Allegheny County. And I think this speaks to how Soldiers and Sailors was being set up as this final repository, this final home for all of the records and, and the history of the GAR here in, in Pittsburgh and the Allegheny County. Um, we still use it for artifact storage today. And uh, we have it filled not necessarily with all the GAR records, but a lot of our, our very rare artifacts. And uh, like I said, you can actually get the opportunity to see this behind the scenes tour um, for a, a generous donation. And you can visit our website to learn more about how you can do that. <clears throat> you can also, we talked a little bit, you mentioned Post 206, and I'm glad you did, um, because that brought up this concept of the personal war sketchbooks that we have as a part of our collection. Uh, these books are... Um, wonderful you know insight into personal stories of veterans of the war and this just happens to be the post 206 colonel robert gould shaw post and uh, it is filled with uh, interesting stories of the members of this all colored post like rich said that technically the gar was not uh, segregated um uh, however just due to geographic sometimes or just you know, geography i should say or due to you know uh, uh just comfortable you know how people were comfortable uh, that, that did work out. And this was a uh, colored post from the city of Pittsburgh, uh, one of 15 from Pennsylvania. And wonderful stories in this book, including Matthew Nesbitt, uh, who was uh, born a slave and was now living as a freed man, a GAR member in the city of Pittsburgh. And uh, you can learn much more about Post 206 in our archives. We have an episode entirely about this book and this post that uh, you can learn so much more about what we're looking at here. Here's a little bit of uh, about the, the meeting spaces in Soldiers and Sailors. We have today what we call the Gettysburg Room and the Hall of Valor, uh, which originally the Hall of Valor was referred to as the Shiloh Room. And these immediately became final meeting places for the GAR. And uh, you can see it set up for a meeting there on the right. Um, on the left there, you see a podium, a cannon table podium um, that uh, might have been used in, in, in some of those meetings. Um, in this case, this one actually has the monogram of the Union Veterans Legion. So just speaking to some of the other kind of auxiliary units and other other and I think that one was a more stringent GAR kind of took a little bit was a little harder to become a member of. But once again, speaking to that lasting legacy of the GAR and the Civil War veterans and soldiers and sailors and 
I think it's fascinating to say that even today, veterans organizations are still meeting, you know, at soldiers and sailors in these rooms that uh, that originally were intended for the for the GAR. Um, you mentioned the cannons, uh, you know, the, the, that uh, the parade cannons. We have a parade cannon here on the left. Um, this was uh, made in the 19th century and used in parades and celebrations by the GAR. The one on the left has an engraved plate and on there it says, McPherson Post number 117, Pittsburgh, PA, July 4th, 1885. This cannon is composed of pieces of a shell from the battlefield of Gettysburg and Pittsburgh Landing, which is also Shiloh. Parts of the carriage and limber are from the Shiloh Chapel and Commodore Perry's flagship Niagara. So they're melding all of this history together and creating this symbolic piece that, uh, uh, you know, who knows, may have been used in a, in in the parade that you were talking about earlier, Rich, but uh, was used as a way to, um, you know, celebrate and honor the the, uh, the 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 veterans of the of the Union Army, and then on the one on the right is directly tied to what you were talking about. Uh, this was made from some of the leftover uh, materials uh, that were used for those badges for the 1894, pro, um, you know, gathering. Uh, what was left over was used to create this. Uh, half scale replica. Both of these are really in half scale, not full size Civil War cannons. And uh, this one was donated to soldiers and sailors uh, in 1915. And then since you mentioned the last uh, GAR member in the North, I wanted to mention uh, Joseph Caldwell, who was the last GAR member uh, in Allegheny County. Uh, he was born in 1847 in Allegheny City. And uh, some quick math shows you that he was pretty young when he served in the in the Civil War and he served with Knapp's Battery among other uh, other uh, units during the war. And afterwards, he served as a contractor. He had seven children living up in Butler County, but moved to Brookline late in his life. And for 84 years, he never missed the Memorial Day in Brookline. So you mentioned the Lawrenceville Parade. Uh, I'm not sure the Brookline parade, parade still happens, but you know, Pittsburgh and its communities and its neighborhoods certainly took up that moniker and and wanted to, um, you know, recognize uh, the significance of Memorial Day and the significance of these veterans. So just a few things I just wanted to touch on that are available to view at Soldiers and Sailors also have been talked about in some uh, uh, programs in the past. As always, I encourage everybody to uh, visit our archives and, and see some of our old videos. And uh, with that, I am just... Uh, seen so many wonderful comments, Rich. I mean, this is, I'm not even going to be able to, to read them all and follow, but I just want to say thank you to Paul and uh, Michael Krause, of course. Michael, we're missing you tonight. Uh, Shmem and, and Brian Higgins from our, our gaming club. Brendan Steed, who I just saw the other day from Pittsburgh. Then we have Keenan Bird and Dom DeBello from California. So we are, we are reaching all across the country. And then Joyce from New Jersey, uh, Emmanuel talking about the flower beds and, and Joyce also mentions that uh, she has an, an ancestor from the GAR uh, that has a GAR marker in her grave in the uh, Beaver Falls PA and a photo uh, uh, has a family photo possibly of this encampment. So uh, when you're talking about the encampment there might have uh, have a photo from that. Uh, Michael Pellegrini, uh, Richard Gibson, uh, William Bray, uh, Roseanne, Keenan, Jay, Richard again, Paul, uh, Jay Rarick, Emmanuel, just want to say thank you to all. I, I, I don't want to get too bogged down with reading everybody's names, but I, I thank you all. Very nice comments. And I do want to take a minute now as we're closing just to mention more about Soldiers and Sailors. I encourage everybody to come visit us. Visit our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org. Just always check on you know our, our hours and special closures just in case. Of course, we always have guided tours available of the museum by appointment. Our next Tabletop Gamers will be December 16th, and that'll be the Battle of the Bulge. So Paul and Brian, who are tuning in tonight, I know uh, they're regular gamers, and uh, they'll be looking forward to seeing you on December 16th for our game day. This Saturday, Veterans Day, uh, we are open free from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. What better day to visit Soldiers and Sailors? I mean, we like to kind of kid around sometimes and say every day is Veterans Day at Soldiers and Sailors, but truly, if there's a day to come and visit us, it's this Saturday. And uh, we really encourage you to come up. And at the end of the evening, right around closing time, they will light up the hill with all our flags that people have purchased on our front lawn. We call it fill the hill and light up the hill. And there will be uh, a wonderful visual and a tribute to our, our local veterans. 
And then our Holly Jolly Holiday Party is coming up on December 3rd from 5 to 9 p.m. This is a new program for us. We've had a holiday concert before, but this is much bigger than that. Uh, we are working with the Toys for Tots, Folds of Honor, and Gunny's Ridge to bring this program an evening of music and fun and food. I know Mission Barbecue will be there. Of course, you'll be able to meet um, Santa, Santa and Mrs. Claus, and uh, there'll be a special performance by Frizzy, who is a, a local rapper who just actually performed with the Pittsburgh Symphony. I just saw that in the paper today. And the North Pittsburgh Symphonic Band. So for the price of $25, you get all this activity, and um, you know we'll celebrate the, the holidays together on December 3rd. Uh, here at Soldiers and Sailors. And um, Paul just chimed in. Uh, Tabletop Gamers also has an off-site game at Braddock's Battlefield History Center on November 18th. Unfortunately, Saturday, uh, November so busy here at the hall, we couldn't have a game day, but we keep the going there at uh, Braddock's Field on November 18th. And then the December game day, not only will be bought Battle of the Bulge, but also will be the uh, Korean War. So we encourage you to come out and join us for, for game day. And then last but not least, spotlight on next month actually is to be determined. <laughs> I've never had to do this before, but uh, we had something fall through. So we are still working on our topic, but uh, you know when it'll be. That's for sure. December 14th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. I encourage you to watch our website and our, our social media to, to learn about the topic. But we hope to see you all come and join us uh, that evening for next month's spotlight on. And uh, with that, Rich. Any last words? I, I just want to say thank you so much to you and, and to all our viewers. But uh, do you have any last words for everybody? Uh, I just want to thank everyone for for tuning in. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with soldiers and sailors, uh, especially you, Tim. And and uh, you know, I want to uh, thank Mike for for letting me kind of tune in here tonight and talk about the Grand Army. It's it's one of my <clears throat> one of my favorite subjects to talk about because it's perfect intersection of of civil war and reconstruction and kind of these tangible things that we can look at when we talk about this kind of history, especially in a place like uh, Western Pennsylvania, especially in a place like uh, soldiers and sailors. So uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. It, it was a great pleasure. Thank you one more time, Rich. And thank you everybody as well. I hope to see you next month in our next spotlight. And I hope to see you at soldiers and sailors uh, this Saturday for veterans day. So have a good evening, everybody take care. And that's going to be the end of the program. Good night, everybody.